I'm Dr. Alan Blum, and I've been honored uh, to have been asked by Alex Carolan, who's the uh, editor of the Cancer History Project, uh, of the Cancer Letter that uh, has been published for many, many years. The editor is uh, Paul Goldberg, and it's a remarkable uh, publication, and they have uh, um, been interested in the Surgeon General's report because we're about to commemorate the 60th anniversary of this report, and uh, I was asked to uh, help produce this podcast. Um, I have the honor today to uh, be uh, interviewing Don Shoplin, someone whom I've known for uh, really quite a few decades and who I admire greatly. He's a, a former 40-year uh, employee of the Public Health Service and the only one in the world who has worked on uh, 37, I think it is, reports of the Surgeon General of the United States on smoking and health, and is uh, the only one who can now say that he was there when the initial report was produced because he was on the staff and the youngest member of that staff. Um, welcome, Don. And your origins are in Maryland, is that correct? Yep. Grew up and in you were Maryland. you were a, a student and an intern at the National Library of Medicine in um, uh, 1962. And uh, you had an interesting circumstance. And before you answer that question, I wanted to say that uh, Alex asked me to do this interview to share with our audience um, the origins of one of the landmark documents of the 20th century, uh, the report of the Advisory Committee to the Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service on smoking and health. And we'll establish that, talk about the origins of the report, talk about its immediate impact, and then what it means today. And I should be clear that I would prefer to call this a commemoration. Uh, a celebration would, would, would sort of suggest it's everything is happy, because I think this is a more nuanced subject. Let's just leave it right now to commemorate an anniversary and hear some of the behind-the-scenes stories that Don Shoplin can share with us. Well, uh, of course... I sort of fell into the work with the advisory committee, as you said. I had just started working for the National Library of Medicine uh, as an entry-level library technician in September of 1962, which was right about the time, I think, that Terry had announced the formation of the committee. And uh, Dr. Dr. Luther Terry we're talking about? Correct, Dr. And, Dr. Luther Terry. And he was the Surgeon General appointed by President John F. Kennedy. By the way, if you could move closer to the microphone, that might uh, just make it a little louder because for me... Uh, all right. Hope Great. that works. Thank you. Um, and so I was, I was a fairly, uh, I was just out of high school uh, and uh, had just started working there in September as a GS3, believe it or not. I think I made all of uh, $55 a week or something like that. Government service? Yeah, this was. Uh, uh, that sounds it, GS, is that yeah, what that stands for? The, the library had just opened up. Uh, they, had, they had been in a downtown area for a number of years and moved out to this huge, beautiful new facility on the NIH campus. Uh, and of course, that's where the advisory committee uh, uh, staff was located. And it's where the advisory committee actually held uh, almost all of its meetings, except for the first uh, one or two uh, introductory meetings. And initially, I worked in the evenings and overtime when they needed someone to help pull a reader request for the um, for the advisory committee, photocopy requests as they were starting to sift through the uh, the data. And then it wasn't until the summer of 1963 that I was then assigned full time to work for the committee. And I didn't find out until later that it actually uh, was done at the request of Dr. Terry himself, which I didn't know it at the time. And so from the, uh, but August of 63 until the end of the project, I worked uh, full time on the committee as part of the staff. So he picked you out because of your eagerness and, and diligence, I, I, I assume. Well, I don't think he picked me out. I think it was the staff that had the you like mentioned that I did. You actually, in correspondence, you've mentioned the uh, the person who did uh, specifically invite you to join. What was her name? Her name was uh, Mildred Bull. Uh, she was a very interesting person. I don't think Mildred was, I think she was probably like 5'10 or 5'11". And uh, she was a, a very important person to the project itself uh, because I don't know if a lot of people don't know the story, but uh, Peter Hamill, who was the medical coordinator and was the chief architect of the committee and, and the report, got sick right in the middle of the project and had to leave suddenly on the advice of his doctor. And they asked Dr. Gene Guthrie to come in and take over. 
And Mildred was the person there, the only really the only real person there who knew what was going on when Dr. Guthrie came in, because there was no transition but between Dr. Terry, I mean between Dr. Uh, uh, Guthrie and Dr. Dr. Hamill. So and you mentioned you mentioned her height because she was such a a, a presence. She, uh, well, she was a very smart lady. Uh, Peter Hamill almost resigned trying to get her a uh, a promotion in the middle of everything because she was only hired as his secretary initially. But she ended up almost being sort of the staff director for the project because she was just so uh, she was just so darn good at what she did, and uh, he finally got her the promotion. But Mildred, Mildred was the glue that held that project together. So I'm, I know we're teasing the listener with uh, uh, bits and pieces of of this background, but just a, a word about yourself. You were intending you you got this internship. Your career intentions were were they library studies or were they uh, research or? Yeah, uh, I I wished I could say that I had this this grand design as to what I wanted to be, but at the time that I joined the library, I had two job offers. I just graduated high school uh, that spring, and I had two job offers. One was with the National Library of Medicine, and the other was with the uh, NAS out in Laurel, Maryland which was a much longer drive. So I opted just to take the library job because it was closer. And, and that was the only planning that went into it. And that stands for the National, the National Association for the Advancement of Science? No, no, that's the, um, I'm sorry. It's the, it was the uh, NSA, the National Security Administration. Ah, right. Yeah, I would have been a spook, I guess. Right. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll now just sort of join you with the committee. And let's take it back, really, as, as far back as, as, uh, how we even had to have a committee to decide whether smoking was dangerous to health. So we go back now. How far would you like to go back to 1900 uh, when the early reports on the increase of lung cancer were beginning to be reported? Or would you like to go to 1930 when we were beginning to see the early epidemiology coming out of Germany and the United States, one published in the New England Journal in 1928 by Lombard and During, pointing to this association between smoking and lung cancer or would you like to go more toward the 40s when debakey and oxner had reported their several hundred case studies of lung cancer and smoking well it, you can start with almost uh, any of those and uh, you could make a case for the fact that they were the early studies that sort of jump-started things but i think if you if you look back and look at the events that really precipitated the uh, the movement in terms of trying to get the public health service to look at this issue, you probably would have to start in the 1950s. And that was when the first uh, case control studies uh, were uh, published uh, very early in the 1950s. And it was the, it was those studies that also got some publicity. If you know about some of the uh, uh, articles that were published by the Consumers Union and by the Reader's Digest, uh, those were the things that started getting a lot more publicity for the issue itself. And then, of course, you had uh, uh, Dr. Leroy Burney, who asked the Public Health Service to establish a study group in the mid-19, I think it was 1956, to take a look at the available evidence, which they did. I think it was, I think that study group was composed of six individuals. Five of them were from the outside of the Public Health Service, and there was one investigator from the NCI who was that study group. And they looked at 16 different studies and, as you know, concluded that they, they, they felt that there was a direct relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And then Dr. Bernie himself issued a statement uh, from that study that said the Public Health Service was, was on record of saying that cigarette smoking was one of the major factors in, uh, in, in lung cancer, although I think he characterized it at the time. He said that excess cigarette smoking was a factor in uh, in lung cancer, and I've never understood where the excess or excessive cigarette adjective came from because uh, the study group didn't say that. Oh wow, I recall that wondering that myself when I first heard the him on film saying that of the the day. So I want to step back one more time, just to put smoking in its context. I, I don't think many people realize that. If you stop and think about it, uh, tobacco has been used for thousands of years. We know that from archaeological evidence of pipes. It's They were found in the Arctic or in the tropics. We think that tobacco was first cultivated in the Caribbean because there's an island called Tobago. And we, there's lots of indications that that's where it, 
it began, but through trade routes, tobacco uh, and presumably smoking uh, was all over the world. We don't have the organic remnants, of course, but we do have the pipes and other ceremonial objects that we believe were used. But something changed um, in the really in the late 19th century, certainly by the 20th century, and that was this thing called lung cancer. And uh, uh, the earliest reports on uh, the dangers of smoking were, as far as I've been able to trace, not just uh, King James I, who called it a custom loathsome uh, to the spirit or whatever, and he issued a counterblast against tobacco when uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and others brought it over from America to England, but really around 1804 when uh, Dr. Uh, Waterhouse, Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse, gave his lecture to the students at Harvard about the injurious uh, effects of smoking and the vinous spirits. He was talking about cigar smoking, but he and he was talking about stomach problems, but I think he at least he was on the right track. But it took another 150 years uh, or more for this committee to be established. And why? Because we were certainly arguing over the instance of lung cancer and smoking. And I, I just want to read from your and my uh, subject today. Um, uh, it's the remarkable report on smoking and health of the advisory committee. And in the very second paragraph of the foreword, Dr. Terry, who was the Surgeon General, few medical questions have stirred such public interest or created more scientific debate than the tobacco health controversy. The interrelationships of smoking and health undoubtedly are complex. The subject does not lend itself to easy answers. Nevertheless, it has been increasingly apparent that answers must be found. So that was his charge. And we go back a bit in time. You've mentioned the reports of the epidemiologist. Uh, the ones that I'm familiar with were Bradford Hill and S Sir Richard Dahl in The Lancet around 1950. Uh, and the British Medical Journal published some of these. And then we had in this country um, Ernst Winder, uh, who Evarts Graham uh, uh, was able to apprentice as his uh, 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 Winder, uh, Winder was one of his students. And they did this epidemiologic work among the groups that they looked at were actually physicians and their instance of lung cancer. And then we had uh, Hammond and Horn uh, working, I believe, for the American Cancer Society first and then ultimately with uh, the Public Health Service. Is that correct? Those are the major epidemiologic groups? Yeah, I think there was a, a, a four studies that were published in 1950 itself. Uh, those were the These were retrospective studies. These, these were all what they called retrospective. Uh, As you mentioned, case four, control. I think they were all four case control studies. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, that those those were the ones that sort of got a little bit of, of the first publicity. Uh, but then, uh, if you remember that, in addition to Hammond and Horn, and then you had the British doctor study, was one of the also one of the first what we call the uh, prospective right. cohort studies. Uh, and then in this country, I think the first one that actually started before Hammond and Horn is that the U.S. veteran study uh, was. Oh, started. was that uh, Levin or uh, or is it uh, uh, that uh, the the person that was head of that was uh, Harold Dorn. Ah. If I recall correct, and I think their study preceded Hammond and Horn by just a little bit, or it could have been maybe Hammond and Horn was a few months before theirs. They they were both initiated at the same time, but they were some of the at the time they were two of of the very largest prospective studies on anything, uh, let alone on cigarette smoking. And of course, both of them showed that uh, along with the British doctor study, uh, that lung cancer among uh, smokers was about ten to fifteen fold higher. Than among comparable non-smokers, and those got uh, those studies when the uh, the results of those came out, they did generate a lot of uh, a publicity that got into the regular national press. Wow, and and I didn't know that about the veteran study, but also think about that the the, the funding somehow was available for that in spite of the controversy, in spite of the doubtless the opposition, and I think that's even more remarkable hearing this. Yeah, uh, and. And the veteran study was really important because I said it was one of the really largest studies around at, at the time until um, uh, Hammond did his, his one million person study at the end of the decade. Wow. The the other a couple of just to dot a couple of eyes, um, Raymond Pearl at Johns Hopkins in the 1930s was looking epidemiologically at smoking and and found what he believed was conclusive results of the uh, causation. Well, certainly the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And it was George Seldes, the, who has been considered the greatest journalist of the 20th century, who almost 
single-handedly uh, got this out into the public because the traditional media, the major newspapers of the day and the radio stations were all beholden to cigarette advertisers and they were not about to bite the hand that fed them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Pearl study was one of the first ones that actually showed that there was an effect on overall mortality, not just lung cancer, but I think the Pearl study looked at uh, overall mortality. Wow. I, I guess the other thing about this, while we're doing this kind of warm up to getting to the report, is that uh, it didn't come out of the blue. There had been discussions and debates uh, over the decades. I mean, I don't know when the term cancer sticks were, were, was coined, but we were, we were talking about uh, smoking and cancer even before Dr. Alton Oxner uh, uh, was, became the most outspoken uh, critic of smoking in the late 1930s. So just briefly, um, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Oxner and giving grand rounds at his, uh, his, his hospital. And at 84, he never took an elevator. We climbed up and down the stairs all day long. He, um, he was a student at Washington University in St. Louis in 1919 when his pathology professor, George Doc, called him down to the morgue and said, take a look at this case. It's called lung cancer. I don't think you're ever going to see another case like it. Yeah. And he found himself 15 years later as a thoracic surgeon uh, pulling out lungs almost every week of patients with lung cancer. And he made the deduction that most of these individuals were veterans of World War I who had started smoking in World War I, thanks largely to free cigarettes given by the Red Cross and medical societies and ladies auxiliaries. And um, again, most are, were men, or had started in World War I, were veterans. And there was this lag time of 15 years. And he was the one who drew this uh, deduction. And with Dr. DeBakey and others published their first, I think, 400 cases uh, in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association by 1939. Uh, but really, it led up to the industry reacting to every one of these things by saying we need more research. And you're not telling the whole story and on and on to the point where the medical community, two thirds of whom smoked, uh, in the night, including my my father, uh, just not buying into this um, uh, association. So we had then, as you mentioned, Dr. Bernie, the Surgeon General. We might want to define what the Surgeon General's office is and what your understanding was at the time that you began working for Dr. Terry. Well, at the time that uh, uh, I joined the Public Health Service, the Surgeon General was essentially the uh, the head of the the entire Public Health Service. Uh, so they were over all the different institutes of NIH, they were over CDC, they were over the FDA, and the the office of the Surgeon General was the management arm of the Public Health Service in terms of managing and administrating the entire health component of PHS. A very big deal, which was probably why uh, Dr. Terry, who was the Surgeon General under whom you worked, um, deferred uh, very, very favorably uh, to Dr. Bernie. Uh, in his own article that he wrote when I was editor of the New, uh, New York State Journal of Medicine, he wrote uh, the, the, what he called the behind-the-scenes account of this, and he credited Dr. Bernie for um, the statement uh, that Dr. Bernie had issued in 1957 and uh, uh, and the formation of that committee. Um, well, as you know, Dr. Dr. Bernie issued another statement, a much lengthier statement, uh, in JAMA, yes, in uh, November, I forget the date, in November of 1959, uh, in which he reviewed additional data from uh, a newer study that had come out since the study group was, was formed. And it was a very lengthy article. And, and the, uh, the thing about that article is that he no sooner issued that article than the editor-in-chief of JAMA castigated Bernie over taking such a strong stand and essentially told Bernie that he had better things to do than to attack cigarette smoking. And he did that in a published editorial. Well, it and was in the same issue. And both of these yeah. are going to be on our exhibition uh, uh, about the Surgeon General's report. Uh, we're updating what I did 10 years ago when you were, our, were really one of our main speakers at the, at the 50th commemoration here at the University of Alabama at Gorgas uh, Library. Um, the um, uh, doctor, uh, Dr. Bernie himself wrote that the disappointment that he had 
by the AMA not taking a position in the 1950s on smoking was compounded by a highly critical editorial by the editor of JAMA, John Talbot. Yeah. By the way, again, I just an aside, I met Dr. Talbot in Miami when I was a resident. I had lunch with him because I wanted to meet all the other editors of JAMA. He was a rheumatologist by training, so I don't know how he could weigh in on smoking, but he did. Um, uh, and, and one never questions the freedom of an editor, Dr. Bernie wrote, to express his views, but in the absence of any official AMA position on the hazards of cigarette smoking and lung cancer, an editorial by the editor in the official publication of the organization could very well lead the medical profession, the public, and the media to assume that the editor was in fact expressing the unspoken position of the AMA. Well, and and the the offshoot of that, you know, of course, the the AMA is is, is and still back then and is still now a very powerful uh, health organization. When you think about it's uh, you know hundreds of thousands of membership, and uh, if you look back at, at that point in time, there were some people that were pushing the public health service to do something education-wise about smoking, and one of the main reasons that they didn't do it was because of Talbert's editorial that all of the newspapers picked up. If, uh, if, if you go online and look at the tobacco documents, you can find pages and pages of newspaper clippings in response to to that uh, letter to the editor that Talbert wrote, and all of them re- pointed out that Talbert and the AMA said that Bernie ought to just mind his own business. Well, by the way, we might want to give a reference to when you said the tobacco industry documents. It's very easily accessible. They are upwards now, I think, of 80 million documents uh, learned in discovery in litigation in the 1990s. They've been supplemented and they've been digitized. What's the website? Is it? Uh, I think if you, if you just go, if you do it, just a search and just say tobacco documents, it will right. show up. That's right. And and this was uh, initially worked on by U- UCSF uh, in California, and now it's uh, quite a repository. Yeah. I think, frankly, just to put in a plug, the uh, our website here at the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society is the perfect complement because I don't have as many internal tobacco documents. But we were the first, actually, back when Eric Solberg was running our group in Baylor in Houston, Eric was the first person to organize tobacco industry documents that we had obtained uh, through some uh, way. Uh, I was entrusted with with uh, quite a few boxes of these, and Eric thought to organize them, and we, we uh, let them go to uh, the FDA, and Dr. Kessler was able to use these in his first attempt to regulate nicotine products in the 1990s. That having been said, uh, these documents today are fascinating. Our center supplements it with, with the original material that the industry said out loud in public that few other people have saved. So um, just to step back again um, to the 1950s, we, we both look at this as a lost opportunity to act on Hammond and Horn, Hill and Dahl, uh, Graham and Winder, and to really take action. Uh, they did not do that. Uh, but then you have the American Cancer Society the uh, American Heart Association, the National Tuberculosis Association, which was the forerunner of the American Lung Association. Um, in your chronology, you noted that they sent a letter to the newly elected president, John F. Kennedy, requesting an advisory committee be established to determine once and for all whether Dr. Bernie's statement is what we should have as the official national position. Is that that correct? Yeah, that's correct. They wrote a letter, I think, uh, I think it was dated June the 1st of 1961, uh, asking him to appoint a commission to look at the entire issue of smoking and health. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, that letter went from the White House over to then what was called DHEW, Health Education and Welfare, and that an undersecretary uh, in that office essentially drafted a reply that said that the appointment of a new commission or a committee by President Kennedy would be inconsistent with his uh, campaign promise to eliminate a number of commissions and committees. Uh, and so that was that was a response that went back to uh, Ms. Sheehan, who was the president of the APHA at the time, that essentially said that uh, the president uh, uh, doesn't think this was would be a good thing to do, essentially, because he's trying to abolish these commissions and not have uh, more appointed. Uh, and from so from there, the uh, the issue sat for a, a number of months uh, until the um, 
uh, voluntary health organizations uh, contacted uh, Secretary Ribicoff at the time and uh, asked that uh, something be done. And I believe uh, at that time, uh, they they had tried to contact Terry, and Terry had recommended to the secretary that a committee be established. But he said, if you did this, you need to check with the White House because there are certain things you need to be aware of politically. Uh, but it's my impression that the secretary's office sat on that request, and it never got forwarded to the White House. So after two attempts, nothing really happened. Uh, and then, of course, you know the story about... Um, uh, the, the Kennedy being, being asked at, at, at his press conference. Well, there's, there's two other things that we... Well, that's right. There, there, there was one more, I, I recall correctly, I think Terry himself at one time when... Uh, it was right after the World College of Physicians report came out, and Terry drafted a very lengthy memo to now Secretary Celebrezzi uh, at HEW, uh, in which he listed seven reasons as to why this issue needs to be looked at again, uh, one of which was new information, obviously. Another was the fact that there had been some uh, legislation introduced in, on the, in the Congress. And, of course, the Royal College of Physicians had just issued a report uh, in which it said that there was a relationship not only with lung cancer, but with heart and probably uh, bronchitis and emphysema as well. And so he listed those seven uh, reasons as to why a, a new look at this should be undertaken. But again, that request sat in Celebrezzi's office and never went forward. Which is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Dr. Bernie, who was the Surgeon General in the 1950s under Dwight David Eisenhower, uh, actually credits his uh, Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, Marion B. Folsom, who had been an uh, officially uh, official of the Eastman Kodak Company, who gave him carte blanche, which I think is really interesting. You think of the Democrat progressive Kennedy uh, being more open, but it was Eisenhower, Eisenhower's administration that actually was more open to, uh, talking about now, perhaps Eisenhower, who had, who spoke very heavily and had a well known, uh, myocardial, uh, uh, had infarction might have been, um, uh, more interested in this than Kennedy was. But certainly we don't get any sense that, uh, John Kennedy or, uh, Calabrese had any interest in this issue, uh, and were more interested in the politics. And just to step back, I forgot to mention the 300 years of American politics during which uh, tobacco became, if not the number one uh, income producer for taxes, among the very top income boosters in the whole United States. This was an economic uh, pillar of society. We couldn't deny that tobacco employed however many hundreds of thousands of people and was a mainstay of the economy of numerous states. So we're not going to just sweep that under the rug. And then we got into the issue of personal freedoms and so forth. But it was clearly not the initial part of the Kennedy administration that was interested in this, even after uh, the Royal College of Physicians report that you mentioned that uh, came out in 1962. And that has its own story that we could go into at some point, but uh, that's, that's the copy. Um, this was really the result of just two people. Um, it was Sir George Godber, who was the uh, one of the architects of the National Health System, National Health Service in England, and who was the chief medical officer, probably the equivalent of the Surgeon General. And he was very upset to be walking in the halls of Parliament and seeing everybody smoking in spite of all the, the epidemiologic evidence that was coming out. And he decided that the government just wasn't going to do anything. So he approached his friend Charles Fletcher of the Royal College of Physicians and said, let's have lunch. And they thought of maybe they could buy some ads and put up some billboards or they thought, but they came upon Fletcher said, well, why don't we, the college issue a report? And he was the guy that pretty much wrote it single-handedly. Yeah, yeah. And that report had an immediate impact in England. And it was a month later that, or two months later, that Pr Kennedy had that press conference. And Edgar Printer, the reporter for the Washington Evening Star, had seen the report and posed the question that Kennedy wasn't expecting to hear. Well, there's this report in England that says they're going to start doing a lot on smoking. What about our administration? Yeah, and yeah. Kennedy tried to fob it off and say, "Well, I don't want to talk about because the stock market is open today. Uh, I'll I'll get back to you." And what he did do was pretty much having to let that committee go forward. And that's how, that's where you come in, and that's where this committee comes in. So let let's just mention what about this committee? How did uh, it get formed? And uh, 
uh, where did it meet and, and, and what were the criteria for a committee member? Well, it was interesting. And, and this is, uh, you could probably say maybe, maybe it was the brilliance of Luther Terry. Uh, when he had gotten the approval from both the secretary and the White House, because both of them had to uh, give him the, uh, the go ahead, uh, he decided to hold a, uh, uh, a, I guess the best thing way you could call it would be a planning meeting and in which he invited all of the, quote, interested parties who had a stake in the game to this meeting to draw up the parameters of the study, as well as the criteria for who would be included in terms of on this committee. And, of course, that meant that you had not only the players in the Public Health Service and the Federal Trade Commission and the FDA, all the voluntaries, the AMA, but it also included the tobacco industry, and so at that meeting, you actually had two representatives uh, from the tobacco industry. One was uh, George Allen, who was president of the Tobacco Institute. And the other was Clarence Cook Little, who was the director of the tobacco, uh, was it the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, if I, if I call yes, it. Yes, that's was, correct. That later morphed into the Council for, for to, Tobacco Research. But, th but they were part of that planning. And so they were part of the group that actually drew up the criteria in terms of what the study would be. And that's where they came up with the idea that there would be two phases. One would be the first phase that would look at the magnitude and the nature of the health threat. And then the phase two study would be if, if they find that, that, uh, that smoking was a health hazard, what would you now do about it? And that was what phase two was supposed to be about. Uh, and those, that group also drew up the criteria. They said that, they did not want anybody who really knew anything about the issue, so that uh, or taking a what they called taking a stand on the issue, which pretty much eliminated anybody who had done any work, uh, you know, any type of, of research on the issue, because obviously that that would have meant they had to take a stand, you know, and they also could not be part of any particular organization uh, was the other criteria, nor could they have had any kind of a public statement either for or against uh, smoking and health. And so from that, it pretty much meant that any committee members that you were going to consider would have to be, quote, virgins in a sense. They had to be people who didn't really know anything about the issue. Uh, and so that group uh, of, I think there was, it was about a dozen different organizations represented around the table. They grew up, they drew up an initial list of 155 individuals. And it was from that list that the committee, the, the, the eventual 10 committee members were were chosen, but the 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 uh, unique thing about that process is that anybody could eliminate an individual to serve on the committee or, or from that list for any reason whatsoever. In fact, they didn't have to even give a reason, so they complete veto power. And so it's remarkable that out of that list of 155 people, we had 10 people that essentially the tobacco industry had approved by virtue of the fact that they did not eliminate any of the individuals that were chosen to serve on the committee. And in fact, I'm told that it, it was uh, the, the, literally the first 10 that they asked, they all agreed. The ones that they first chose to invite to be on the committee, every single one that, were, you know, literally the, the priority that they had were, were the ones that accepted. Uh, that's actually not quite true. Oh, no? There, there, were, there were a number of, of people that actually uh, declined. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, um, you know, as you know, we have a, a book coming out about the 64 report that we hope is going to be published in the uh, spring. The we being? Uh, it, it was myself and four other people that actually worked on the report. Uh, two were committee members, which were Manny Farber and Mickey LeMater, and two of the uh, senior PHS um, uh, professionals, it was, which was Dr. Uh, Drs. Guthrie and uh, Dr. Uh, Hamill. Uh, and so the, the, the book will, will be essentially a collection of us putting together our best narrative that we could in terms of how we actually put that report together. But it also goes into a lot of the events that led up to it and including the selection and who agreed to serve and who did not agree to serve as well. Well, I'm doubly uh, appreciative that you've chosen to honor us with, with talking about that, giving us some 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 little previews of it but uh i i guess whether it was the first 10 or whatever that they chose i i was struck too unless you could correct me here 
I, there were obviously no women uh, selected, but I didn't even see in the list of 155, I think it actually totals uh, 188 uh, sources that they cite, that Dr. Terry cites in the uh, acknowledgments. I did not see or recognize any women. Uh, I, there, I, I mean, there were a few cited, but none were selected for the committee. And was that ever something that you thought of? I never, I never had a chance to talk to anybody about it. And of course, you're now talking about the early 1960s, and it was a very much of a male-dominated uh, movement, if you will, of society. Uh, I'll be interested. Uh, the I think the original list of 155, which, by the way, uh, five names were eliminated from that. They really actually chose the 10 from a list of 150. And we asked Peter Hamble about uh, rather who who was eliminated and was any eliminated by the tobacco industry. And he said the tobacco industry never eliminated anybody. So the five that were eliminated were eliminated by somebody else. But uh, I don't recall uh, him talking about any body other than the 12 or 15 that he contacted and wanted to actually serve. None of those were, were, were women either. It would be, I'd be interested to know if we went back to the archives and found the original list as to whether there was any women actually listed. Uh, maybe some weren't listed because many, maybe more women had spoken out like Senator Marie Newberger on smoking. But I'm just <laughs> hypothesizing the fact we could talk about her for the whole hour. But uh, she was the first elected official that I'm aware of, uh, the senator from Oregon to really blast the tobacco industry and call for remedial action and do everything. And her book is, uh, in fact, as long as I brought her up, let me just mention a quote that I, I found in her introduction. Uh, she cites um, right after the publication of the Royal College of Physicians report that we were just alluding to, uh, someone wrote, a, a journalist writing in the Lancet uh, said, future historians will have views on our failure to find even a partial solution to the problem of smoking during the first 10 years after its dangers were revealed. Uh, the, now, I don't know whether they're referring to the dangers having been revealed by, I think, Hill and Dahl in 1950. Um, the enormous and increasing number of deaths from smokers' cancer may go, smokers' cancer may go down in history as a strong indictment of our political and economic ways of life. And then she adds, yet which segments of our society and which institutions will these future historians indict? The tobacco industry? for its callous and myopic pursuit of its own self-interest, the government for its timidity and inertia in failing to formulate a positive program for a prophylaxis, the medical profession for abdicating its role of leader in this crucial area of public health, or is the individual, smoker and non-smoker alike, incriminated by his failure to accept responsibility for his own and his society's well-being? She said that she thinks all of those folks are going to be blamed. I and I, I think she was very prophetic. Check, you can check all of those boxes, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's 1962 that she said this, and I think we make the, almost the same statement today. But uh, just to go back to that selection, um, we we had these people, uh, they all agreed to meet, and there were some extraordinary uh, backgrounds, uh, chairman of pathology, uh, an epidemiologist, biostatistics experts. Uh, they certainly got a, a, a great, well-rounded group. Um, well, you you, uh, you have to. Uh, there is a. If you know who Peter Ham Peter Hamill is, uh, he did a series of interviews for the J.F. Kennedy Oral History Project that he did in 1969 and 1970, which isn't too many years after the report came out. Uh, and you can get these off their website, by the way. He goes into a lot. Of, he was the one that that Terry charged with actually uh, selecting and vetting the committee members. And he was he was a very young guy at the time. He was only 36 years old uh, when he was tapped to actually serve as the medical coordinator to the to the committee. But he was the one that vetted all those guys. And in his interviews, he goes into a very lengthy discussion of who he was looking for, the types of talents, the disciplines he was looking for, what type of people they were, what kind of thinkers they were. Uh, as I said in, in part of the, of the introduction I wrote for our book, he was really, if we were looking at this today, we would say he was looking for people who thought outside the box. Wow. And, uh, and it really was, he wanted people who weren't afraid to mix it up in an argument. And even though they were going to be arguing with about data or at least studies, 
that they didn't really have a lot of familiarity with, but he, he knew that these were people that could do a good job of, quote, educating themselves during the process and be willing to actually take on a debate uh, in, in this committee if they felt strongly about certain issues. And, and that was the type of people he was looking for. He wanted people who weren't afraid to speak up. My understanding is that he was, uh, again, another boy wonder. He, uh, at 29, was, well, he, had, he was a physician. He graduated medical school and then got an MPH and was offered, I believe, a chairmanship uh, and turned it down, went to Emory to, to establish uh, a preventive medicine department, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I don't know about his earlier uh, history. Uh, at the time that he was chosen to be the medical coordinator, he was the chief epidemiologist for the Division of Air Pollution Control at PHS. This would have been the precursor that eventually morphed and probably into the EPA back into the 70s. Wow. Uh, but he was a so he was he was an epidemiologist by by training as well. He was also a former Golden Gloves boxing champion. That's right. Guy. That's right. <laughs> you know, and in the uh, in the book, I I cite him as being a brilliant intense and he was really what i would call a renaissance man he was very highly educated a very rounded education and this comes through in his interviews with the kennedy school uh and he was he was probably a he was even a pretty smart cookie well let's uh let's uh, now that we've done the uh, speaking of boxing the preliminary rounds let's get to the main bout and the main bout would be i guess you'd start it with that first meeting of the committee and how they set the, their course and then that uh, unexpected blow that they received fairly early on that led them to react and to be even more independent. Well, the, the, the you know, it, it, people lose sight of the fact when the, the committee was first established, uh, Luther Terry and them thought that this could be done in six or seven months because that's, that's the way that most other committees had worked on this kind of an issue and they could do a report in, you know, five, six, seven months. But here you had a group of 10 guys that didn't know anything about the, the issues. They weren't, they weren't familiar with the data. They weren't experts. And here they had sort of dumped in their lap 7,000 studies that they now got to sift through. And these guys, you know, didn't know what to do with it. They actually spent the first two meetings trying to figure out what they were going to do. So the, the November meeting, and the January meeting is where they really started to try to grapple with how they were going to structure themselves, but more importantly, how what type of methodology were they going to adopt in order to be able to issue a report that would essentially um, stop the controversy or that was going to end the controversy as to whether smoking was a health risk. And a lot of these guys, as you know, were cigarette smokers. And so they, they, they came with a certain amount of bias in some cases. Uh, and like anybody else that, that was around at that time, if you were a smoker, you didn't want to believe this stuff. And they weren't any different those than, than the general public was. But it, it took them a good two months or two committee meetings before they actually got deep enough into some of the uh, discussions about some of the data before they themselves decided that, that if they were going to answer this question, they were going to have to go uh, a lot deeper than 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 what uh, the public health services expect them to do and come up with something a lot more detailed than something like the Royal College of Physicians. Let's not forget, just to step back a little bit, even to the 50s and even back to the 40s, you know, there was a hearing of the Federal Trade Commission in the early 1940s about the outlandish health claims of cigarette advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, uh, just like all these appeals we hear about of certain figures being about to be criminally charged, uh, they kept delaying and delaying, delaying, even though the FTC said, you can't say that more doctors smoke camels. It took them 10 years to correct it. Uh, so you have the leading advertiser on radio and in newspapers, literally the leading advertiser uh, blocking any uh, uh, real convincing evidence because they'd always say there's another side. They would always give the other side. And Bernie himself uh, writes that um, he gave the tobacco industry the courtesy a couple of days before he issued his first statement saying there's sufficient evidence to support the claim that there is a causal link between smoking and lung cancer. 
they immediately released at the same time as his statement. That's how they repaid his kindness with a blistering attack on it. And so he said that you should never trust that industry in any way, shape or form. So we come to this pass where I think this committee was aware of that. Um, and then you point out in our earlier correspondence that uh, one day they came into their meeting and they were told they better get it done quickly. That's that's correct. That happened at the uh, at the May meeting, uh, which was about the third or fourth, or uh, that would have been the fourth meeting. And this was they the were meeting at the day. National Library of Medicine. Correct. Uh, and uh, James Hunley, who was the uh, Assistant Surgeon General and chaired all the meetings of the advisory committee, or he he either chaired or co-chaired. He essentially came in, went into an executive session, and said that. Uh, Essentially, we got to get you all got to get the report out and get the report out now. And he sort of gave them two options: you can either finish up what where you are right now and issue the report, or you can let the PHS take it over and let them finish up the report for you. And of course, the uh, the committee went ballistic, you know, uh, because just the meeting before in March, uh, Hunley himself had drawn up a timeline for the report, and it said it looks like given where we are that probably the best we can probably do is have a report issued by the end of the year. And the committee agreed with it. They thought that was a, 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 uh, a logical uh, timeline and one that they would then work toward. And now here the next meeting, he's saying, you've got to finish up the report and finish it up now. And they, the, the committee was so angry, they literally told him to leave the room while they decided? Uh, they, they essentially threw him out of the room and uh, they went into their own executive session uh, and tried to make sense about what they thought was going on. Uh, they bantered back and forth about, to, you know, what they thought was the, the push behind all of this. They had pushed Hunley to find out whether Dr. Terry knew about it. Was he behind it? They wanted to speak to Dr. Terry, and uh, Hunley essentially said that he wasn't available and was noncommittal about whether Terry knew anything. Uh, and so they brought back Hunley. They brought Hunley back in a, for a, 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 another discussion about what was going on and pressing some more. Hunley still really wasn't you know, giving up any information. They asked him to leave again. And at that point in time, uh, they decided that they were going to take over the report, that the report was going to be theirs and theirs alone. Uh, they decided that uh, there would be no minority report on any issue, that everything that they would agree upon would be unanimous. Uh, and which probably probably came back to haunt them in some cases, which we can discuss a little bit later on, you know, and they essentially called uh, Honey back in and, and said, uh, we're going to do it our way. You all won't be able to see the report. We will issue the report directly to the public, neither you nor Dr. Terry nor the department nor the White House will be allowed to see this report until it's made public. Yes, and it's just every time I, I, I hear the story, I, I learn something new. And, 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 uh, it's, 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 if, in case we don't get to it, because we're, we're, we'll wrap it up not that long from now, is the, uh, one of the regrets is that they really didn't tackle addiction. Well, they, I think they tried to tackle addiction. And, and let's keep also something in mind as well. Uh, these guys weren't addiction experts by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, having talked to, I know Mickey at some length about this, uh, and Mickey Lemater, who was the youngest Mickey member Lemater, of the committee. Uh, who was the youngest member, and uh, Len Schumann years ago. Uh, Len, was, Len was the only epidemiologist on, on the committee, by the way, at least uh, what the I University of Minnesota. A card-carrying epidemiologist. Uh, and they admitted that uh, they, 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 they really pushed the issue and really wanted to declare smoking uh, addictive. Uh, Seavers was the person that pretty much held everything up. Uh, and he had been on the WHO committee that had established uh, a lot of the uh, uh, WHO criteria for different substances, including nicotine. And they held at that time that it was not addictive, but it was habitual. And that's what he fell back on. it, And that's what he said the committee had to go to. That was the only criteria that they had at that time was to use the WHO criteria. And they held that it was habituating and not addictive. But it, from my understanding is, is that either all of the committee or uh, most of the committee wanted to label it addictive, 
but again, this is where uh, Severs was the person who really knew the most about it, and he relied too much on the WHO criteria. Uh, plus, they knew they didn't want to do a minority report. He was the uh, chair of, psych of pharmacology at the University of Michigan. Correct. His field was listed as pharmacology of anesthesia and habit-forming drugs. I'll just quickly review. Dr. Schumann was professor of epidemiology at the University of Minnesota, and his field was uh, health and its relationship to the total environment. Uh, Lemaitre was a professor of internal medicine at the University of Texas Southwest Medical School, and his specialty was internal medicine and pulmonary diseases and preventive medicine. Uh, John Hickam, an internist, uh, was a specialist in physiology of cardiopulmonary disease. Jacob Firth, professor of pathology at Columbia, uh, was uh, an expert in cancer biology. Louis Pfizer, uh, professor of organic chemistry at Harvard, was an expert in the chemistry of carcinogenic hydrocarbons. Manny Farber was chairman of the Department of Pathology at the University of Pittsburgh, an expert in experimental and clinical pathology. William Cochran, professor of statistics at Harvard, um, with special application to biological problems. And uh, two more, Walter Burdett, who was head of surgery at the University of Utah, was a geneticist and also a clinical experimental surgeon. Lastly, Dr. Uh, Bain Jones, uh, Stanhope Bain Jones, the eldest member of the committee, uh, retired at that time, and a past president of the Society of American Bacteriologists was uh, a, an expert in the nature and causation of disease in human populations. Correct. So um, they, they proceeded, uh, they had a, a, a remarkable work by the staff um, of getting these articles, you were pulling articles, they were evaluating, you said their total about 7,000. And they divided up the various chapters among the committee members. And you said all was proceeding pretty well, except for one. Well, the cancer chapter. <laughs> <laughs> the most of, important. Of all things. Uh, when they uh, sort of decided as to how they were going to divvy this up uh, during the January meeting, it was between the November and January meetings, uh, Burdett had agreed to take on the cancer chapter. Uh, which was logical. I mean, he had a background in it. He was a, he was a very well-known thoracic surgeon. And from what uh, everybody talked about the Burdett is that he not only was brilliant, but everything he touched, he, he tended to, to be able to be a uh, real go-getter and could take on anything and get anything done. Uh, he was supposed to be, you know, if he had a, a room full of people, he'd be declared the smartest guy in the room, uh, so to speak. But he also was a geneticist. In fact, uh, he had written several books about genetics, uh, had, a, had a degree in genetics. And a lot of the cancer chapter, as he was approaching it, unfortunately put too much emphasis on genetic and constitutional factors as related to uh, cancer etiology, particularly lung cancer etiology. And it was a very uh, slow, uh, I think the way that, that uh, Mickey Lemaitre described it is that it was almost like pulling teeth trying to get Burdett to put more emphasis on the epidemiology of cigarette smoking and cancer of different sites and less emphasis on the genetic aspect of it. And by the time the uh, summer was uh, late summer was, was coming on, the cancer chapter was still in pretty much disarray. Uh, uh, a lot of stuff was there. You know, the, the, I'd say the bones, the way described, the bones of the chapter was there, uh, but they really were dissatisfied with uh, how the chapter was shaping up. And about this time, it was when um, uh, Hamill was was getting sick and was starting to take more and more uh, treatments for him. He had a very painful neck condition, and it was at about that time that his physician said that he had to uh, give up work immediately. And what uh, Hamill did is that he privately contacted Len Schumann and asked Len Schumann if he would take on the task of trying to incorporate the, the data from all the dep dep epidemiologic studies on lung and other cancers. Schumann agreed to do it. In fact, what Schumann did is he took 30, uh, 30 days leave from his post at the University of Minnesota and spent it at committee headquarters from the middle of August until the middle of September, completely rewriting a lot of the chapter, emphasizing the epidemiology of lung cancer as it related to cigarette smoking. And it, believe it or not, it was something that the other committee members knew nothing about. 
uh, when we were writing the book, uh, uh, John Harkness at the University of Minnesota uh, pointed out to him all the, the yeoman work that Schumann had done, and Mickey didn't know about it. So I spent a full day up at the University of Minnesota going through uh, the archives collection up there of uh, Schumann and found all kinds of documentation for it, including his his uh, 30 day stay at the local hotel oh. in Bethesda. And the fact that I do remember very distinctly because I about the same time that I went to work for the committee, Lynn Schumann was there quite a bit. And I didn't know who he was at the time because you know, as a you know, 18 year old kid, what do I, what did I know? And I told Mickey that. Uh, and so it all kind of dovetailed uh, the fact that he actually spent a good part of uh, his summer writing the cancer chapter that if he had not done that, you know, the, the report probably would have been delayed by at least a couple of months. I heard he, he used his vacation time to, he, to do I said this. he used his 30-day vacation time from the university uh, to, and spent it at uh, the headquarters uh, in the basement of the National Library of Medicine uh, rewriting that chapter. Well, let's, let's uh, just advance it forward to uh, November 22nd, 1963. Yeah, it was a very uh, uh, sad day. The, uh, the committee was coming in for a meeting that very weekend. Uh, and uh, keep in mind, because these guys all had academic positions back at their home base, when they came in to meet as a committee, they, the, the meetings were always on the weekend. So they could continue doing uh, their normal work. So they would come in on a Friday and would spend Friday, Saturday, sometimes Sunday, sometimes Monday, depending on, on the workload. Uh, and that particular weekend, they were supposed to meet. And as it happened, of course, Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. Uh, and believe it or not, uh, Mickey LeMaitre was called into Park Lawn Hospital to uh, work on John Conley uh, with one of his uh, colleagues who was actually called over and he took Mickey with him. And we actually had to contact um, uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's office, his, her secretary, to find out if we should even meet that weekend, given the, uh, the circumstances. And we got to go ahead and, 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 to, and to work that, uh, that weekend, even though it was a very, you talk about a somber, uh, somber meeting. Uh, that was yeah, you, were, you were nearing the very end of the report. Well, we were we were at the at the point to where they were writing the conclusions now uh, and writing a lot of, of the uh, judgments that they were going to then uh, uh, make in terms of the different relationships in anticipation that they may or may not meet one more time, what they eventually did. Uh, but that meeting went through Monday and I think into Tuesday because of the of the circumstances. And uh, ironically, uh, that night, that Friday night, the night of his assassination, uh, the, National, the National Library of Medicine is right across the street from the National Navy Medical Center. And we were there when they brought Kennedy's body in for doing an autopsy. Hmm. It was right across the street from us. So we were, we were sort of on the tail end of that history uh, when they brought his, his body in to be, uh, to be autopsied that weekend. Yeah, history almost changed in, uh, regarding the report because uh, there was some question with the new president whether this report would be released. And one of the suspicions was that because uh, President Johnson's close uh, advisor uh, had been a lobbyist, well, had been the lawyer for the tobacco, main tobacco organizations, uh, that there might, these, this report might be deep sixed. Well, I don't know. Uh of any effort that was made by anybody either at the department level or the White House to stop the report. If, if, it, if it happened, I was never aware of it. Uh, the, the person who would have known that would have been Gene Guthrie, who was that time now had taken over for Hamill and was the medical director of the report and was essentially in charge of it. Uh, he has never mentioned that, and, and I've, I've known Gene for a number of years. I knew him well after the report came out. He and I met uh, several times and talked about the report and what went on. He never mentioned anybody interfering with the thing. So I don't know that – I don't know that that has any credibility that someone actually, like Fordis or anybody else, uh, 
I'll okay. keep, uh, you mentioned For Fortas being Abe Fortas, who became the Supreme Court judge under Johnson uh, and then resigned because of <laughs> fairly minor things compared to what we see today. Uh, but in, in any event, uh, I, 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 Dr. Levito did share with me, and I'm going to try to track it down, that he spoke to Johnson, whether he spoke to him just in passing or since they were both Texans, uh, to encourage him to let this report go forward. Um, I got the sense that Dr. Lemaitre felt that uh, Abe Fortas was going to lobby against uh, releasing that report. But I'm going to I'm going to I'll follow you'll, up with you. You'll, you'll have to because I remember talking to Mickey at one point and I'll have to say I don't recall what the genesis of the conversation was. I remember him saying that he had met Johnson in his office at one point and Abe Fortas was there. Uh, well, we agree on that, at least. And it was my impression this was after the report was released in which Mickey had, quote, you know, almost like volunteered his time to Johnson to talk about implementation of something in terms of any kind of, of anti-smoking activity. And it was at that point that Mickey told me that he turned to Abe Fortas and said that Abe Fortas was going to be his guy on that or something uh. to that effect. But it was my impression that was after the report was released. Well, well, I'll keep I'll keep searching for that holy grail. But I think that what we're doing now is we begin to wind down. We're we're talking about the moment of the release, but then the aftermath. One thing we do know for sure that that Lyndon Johnson never endorsed the report. Uh, he he permitted it to go through, um, and I went to the LBJ Library where we had our exhibition. Uh, that you saw 10 years ago, we had it also, they they had it uh, at the LBJ library. So I asked to go up to the, um, one day I spent up in the library part, and I asked them if they could produce their archive on anything to do with smoking under Johnson. And they gave me two little boxes with a bunch of letters from the public. And there was literally nothing else. Yeah. Uh, I kept saying, no, no, I would like maybe some behind the scenes policy thing. No, they had nothing. So uh, he was not uh, as far as I know, ever, even when he had his illnesses, Johnson smoked, but I don't think it ever really came up. He, he was not a, a strong endorser of that report. I haven't had a chance to ask Califano, who worked in the Johnson administration, whether uh, there was anything else, but uh, it, it well, just seems to me that Johnson did his good deed by letting it go forward. Name, name me one president that I would say was a big supporter of, of, of the smoke and control movement. That's right. And, I don't and know of any. This gets into the, 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 the last really point of it. Uh, what, what people will see on the website or will be the, some of the videotape of the film of when Dr. Terry released it. We have some, uh, documentaries that were done by CBS and NBC that I got a hold of, and that's going to be shown. I think the Harry Reasoner documentary uh, on smoking and health uh, issued that March, uh, two months after the report, is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. He literally interviews the tobacco industry, the um, uh, man in the street, school kids, uh, uh, some members of the report. It's it's riveting. And he, he interviews the advertising uh, agencies and uh, David Olgavy, who was the first ad agency to re re decline cigarette advertising. But in any event... Your opinion then of the impact of the report immediately and then long term, because you are the only one who was there from the outset to fully, uh, what, till 2014, working on virtually every report of the certain generals. Did these subsequent reports that came out, did they have a major role compared to the initial report or were they there to just reinforce it? it you know, it's, it's hard to say, you know, you know. Uh, there, are, there were probably a, were a few reports in the series that probably had an immediate impact. I, th I think the major impact of these reports is in their totality, in terms of documenting the uh, the health risks that then permitted, you know, other people especially to do something about it. People like yourself, uh, the voluntaries. Uh, certainly once you got into the nicotine stuff and the FDA got more involved, but that was like 30 years later, you could make some uh, uh, a judgment that uh, the report on nicotine addiction maybe pushed that further. But I think the, the real effect or the real impact of those reports has been what we what I would call the, the constant drumbeat of more and more pronouncements that eventually, I think, more than anything else, undermine the behavior. 
It undermined the social acceptability of smoking. And I think that particularly was true once we started documenting that it had an effect on the non-smoker. I, but I think all of those, the reports taken in total, eventually just move the needle forward little bit by little bit. There were no big changes, as you know, from, from year to year. And I think what we're seeing now, even though it's taken, what, 60 years, we're now, we're now looking at the, at the end result of that. If you go back to, say, before the report when you had close to 50% of the adult population smoking, you now the latest figures that I saw come out of CDC for, um, I guess it was 2000 or 2022, is showing the adult rate now to 11.2%. So we're almost getting down to single digits. Right, and even teens, even lower than that. But, you know, I'll give the other side of that in any day, and that is, uh, first of all, it took 60 years to do it. We didn't start seeing a decline in lung cancer rates among men. Uh, it's still not declining among women. Uh, we, uh, I think the three reports, if we want to talk about the positive steps forward, that I would vote for, I think you and I have corresponded about this. I think the passive smoking uh, Surgeon General's report, the um, the report on addiction, or, or uh, and I would say the report on women. Uh, those were major uh, earth-shaking headlines that did propel uh, changes. Uh, the passive smoking led to the a ban on smoking on airlines, the first federal effort on clean indoor air that I'm aware of. So there was not much federal legislation passed as a result of the Surgeon General's report until no, I, and I think that that just bolsters my point. I, I think a, a lot of the uh, sort of successful anti-smoking steps that we've taken have been taken outside of government, right? Know, by the activists or whoever who were always ahead of the science to begin with. As you as you know, uh, the science always comes later, and the the people out in the uh, in the uh, hinterland, if you will, are the ones that take the early action uh, because they can. As you pointed out in the earliest part of this conversation, the AMA, which really uh, is was the the, the voice of, of American medicine and was was respected and and listened to, uh, was um, they were they were absent from the room. They 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 were the only major medical entity in the country that has never endorsed the sixty four report. Well, what happened was they didn't endorse it, um, but in 1979, uh, after 15 years, they published their AMA Education Research Foundation report saying, you know, the Surgeon General is probably right back in 64. Yeah, but that, that's, but, that's, 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 Johnny, that's Johnny come lately, isn't it? Right. And, but let's go back to November 22nd, 1963. A fellow named Roy Ritz, who was chairman of, who became chairman of, of uh, immunology at uh, Mayo, uh, had been JFK's personal physician at the naval base, and he had been lured by the AMA to come to Chicago to head up the AMA's Education Research Foundation. The day that he arrived on the job, I, I had the privilege of serving on a committee of the FDA with Dr. Uh, Ritz. Uh, he arrived in Chicago on November 22nd, 1963, to hear two points of news. Number one, that his patient, JFK had been killed. And the second bad news he heard was that was, was told to him as good news. It's good news. We, the AMA just got, uh, we just got $5 million to do more research. And he said, five million, that was like 50 million today. And he said, really, that's incredible. And he said, who's it from? He said that they said from the tobacco industry. And he practically quit right then and there because he was going to be the director of this. And he smoked, by the way, but that did not influence his. And he said, no, that's not. And they said, okay, you don't have to work with that money. So uh, Ritz didn't last long at the AMA ERF, but he did uh, relate to me his disappointment even back then. And he joked that, yeah, the AMA did once issue a booklet that said if you smoke in bed, that might cause a fire. <laughs> but, but for 15 years, from 1964 to 1979, the AMA virtually was silent on this issue because yeah. they were taking uh, what it turned out to be $18 million dollars from the tobacco industry to do more research. And as we close, you know, we look at the mantra. I, I think we're still doing that today. University of Southern California, I heard last week, got $20 million to study nicotine uh, policy in, in pediatrics. $20 million to study what? More what? 
in an age where we're not regulating, we're going backwards. We're, we're actually having less regulation these days. Well, what, one of the ironies of almost any kind of a, of a public health problem, and, and not just smoking, I think it's a lot of them, is that as you, as you get the problem solved, you now find more money than you can deal with. Yeah. Whereas back in the early days, when the, when the problem was the greatest and the need the most, you know, we were dealing with nickels and dimes. You got 7,000 studies to study. By 1985, Dr. Koop, the Surgeon General then, who made smoking a, a bully pulpit issue, and even after he was opposed by all the public health associations before, because he was a supporter, uh, he was in opposition to abortion. But he said, we have now 50,000 studies. And the industry was saying, we need more research, we need more research. And he said, what more research do we need? We've got 50,000 studies that show proof positive. Well, do you know how many there are today, Don? There's probably 100,000. There's 356,000. At least that's what it was in 2021 when I had a piece of the Lancet. I don't think so. And, and, and this is the sad part about our own culpability. We in the health professions really owed it to the public to act and not continue to study. We love studying, but we've got to translate our research sooner than later. And I, I, I know that we could probably, and we're going to have this opportunity in person when on January the 11th, we commemorate this report and we have the honor to host you at the University of Alabama. But I just can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, to talk with us. And we really just scratched the surface, but you are uh, widely respected in your field as um, someone who's been on the inside, who who engages in respectful conversation and debate at every turn. Lord knows we've disagreed on so many things, but you always take the high road. You've always been a great...